our next speaker is Dr. Sridhar Vembu, co-founder and CEO of Zoho Corp. Dr. Sridhar Vembu is known for his unconventional choices. Sridhar started a product company in India where the service sector was all the rage in the IT sector. In 2005, he became, began the Zoho University program with six high school students who were trained for two years in computer science and eventually absorbed in the company. Currently, 15% of Zoho's workforce is made up of Zoho graduates. Instead of opening new offices in metros, he prefers smaller towns or suburbs. In 2016, the Teng Kasi office, located in rural India, launched Zoho Desk, a product that was developed there. Sridhar Vembu has also been instrumental in deepening and broadening the product portfolio of Zoho, stressing on the need for an integrated suit that solves all business problems end to end. He also advocates investing more on R&D than marketing. As a result, in 2017, Zoho launched Zoho One, a revolutionary suit that offered 40 plus products and just uh, $30 per employee per month. Dr. Sridhar Vembu will now speak on literature as experiencing another life. Actually, I want to thank uh, Professor Mishra for enlightening me about the root sounds. I'm actually in the you know, made a, yesterday I was in an event in Bengaluru where they launched an app to learn Sanskrit. So I promised that I will be learning. I'm actually only now I can read the script now. And I was so, you know, I grew up here, right? In Tamil Nadu, in our state, we only had Tamil and English. So we were, our education system actively discouraged learning anything else. So now only I learned the Devanagari script. So now I'm going to learn Sanskrit too. The app yesterday was going to be good. I'll definitely, the root, the root sounds you mentioned uh, sounds really interesting to me. Thank you. So I learned this, this event. So I am in a literary festival. I am a businessman. And you know, I'm crass enough to be making money. And uh, people doing literature are supposed to be poor. So, so I don't know that. <laughs> But, uh, so, I will, you have to make do. So I'll apologize for not being a you know, highly literary person. Because my daily life, I worry about uh, uh, the other counterpart to all this, right? How does our country stand on its own two feet in technology, self-reliance? Because the way I see it, most of our problems come from us not being self-reliant in technology. And it goes very deep. I mean, modern economics is almost entirely about technology. So it's uh, you'll, once once you get deeper into this, uh, you will realize why that's true, and you will see that so much of what we rely on in our daily lives, almost all the technology in this room, the root components come from abroad. So we don't have the know-how here. This. Uh, this mic stand, I can, I can almost tell you from the phones, from the cameras, from the, all of the technology, the LED, the LED drivers, the chips inside, the software running all those cameras, all of it. So you take any modern advanced technology now, well, our brains may be involved in producing it, but we as a nation don't get much benefit from it except as consumers, as customers. So to me, that is the problem I'm solving. But I'll tell you what, where literature played a role in my evolution, uh, in my thought process. So I was a student in IIT Madras from 85 to 89. I'm supposed to be, I was supposed to be studying electrical engineering. And I actually rejected computer science as uh, not interested. I was not interested in programming. I was not interested in software. So, which. You know, the world had other plans for me, but I seriously, in 85, you asked me, you will end up, you know, 
being a software entrepreneur, I would have said, outlandish, no way it's possible. So what was I doing in IIT? I was reading. I'll hit the library and I was reading, reading, reading. Mostly I was not interested in our classes. Luckily in IIT at that time, there was no attendance rule at all. You don't have to go to class. <laughs> and most of my classmates, all of us used it so well, this feature, we exploited this bug. They imposed an attendance rule in our third year because of us. <laughs> and we fought it. I was one of those who fought it. In fact, I argued that if our professors cannot inspire us, why should we attend the class? <laughs> right? It was a simple question. So, and, uh, so those were the times. But the attendance rules, so they delayed it until we left IIT. So. <laughs> Now, and at that time it was 55%, now it's 85%. You have to attend 85% of the classes to graduate. When I entered IIT, it was 0%. You don't have to attend anything. I have illustrious classmates who never saw the inside of a classroom for entire semesters. <laughs> so what was I doing? I was reading. What was I reading? I was reading Bertrand Russell at that time. I was reading a lot of, I read the entire collected works of George Orwell. And then I started to, you know, and so I read a lot of political economy at that time. I wasn't ever a socialist. I got rid of that at age 15, thanks to a communist teacher in school. <laughs> so, and uh, at 15, in fact, the debate would be, he would say, we are going to have a revolution. Then I'd ask him very innocently, so what would happen? Everything will be won by the government after the revolution. So I'd ask him, so like our telephones department now? Seriously. So, so we'll have a 10-year wait list for telephone, and that's what in every field that we have to do. He would have no answer. He would say, no, people will develop a socialist consciousness. After that, all those delays won't be there. This was his answer, actually. Let's say that even at 15, I could figure out that is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> so I got rid of it at 15. But I didn't know what to believe though. I know I don't believe in socialism, but I didn't know what to believe. But all these, from all this reading, convinced me that what is our, and pretty much I ended up being a businessman later because I convinced myself that that's the only path that our nation, it's not, the route is not in politics, it's going to be in business, it's going to be in invention, it's not going to be in technology, all of that. Though I wasn't personally paying attention to any technology at that time. I skipped classes, I wasn't, I was supposed to be learning about electrical motors, I'm going and reading about George Orwell. So this is what actually was happening in IIT. Then I ended up in Princeton, I did some mathematical work, was thoroughly dissatisfied with all that. I learned way too much mathematics, but I realized that it wasn't going to be useful to anybody. In fact, I told my advisor, if they are going to burn my PhD thesis and nobody ever, ever read it, the world will not miss it at all <laughs> in Princeton. I don't think anybody ever read it after that. <laughs> after I submitted in 94, my PhD thesis might as well, no, I could have burnt it. <laughs> so that was a very humbling realization, right, in 94. So my reading was, you know, at that point, I started reading a lot about two countries, Japan and Singapore. I was already in Princeton. I'm reading a lot about Japan. I'm reading a lot about Singapore. Why, even, why am I reading about Singapore? Well, Singapore is a, you know, in 1960s, it's a third world city. It's poorer than Chennai is today, much poorer than Chennai is today. With three languages, three religions, three races, communal riots burning everywhere. This was the circumstance in 1965, 66, when they were kicked out of the Malaysian Federation. Okay, And then this city-state, which didn't want to be born, they actually begged Malaysia to keep them. If you go read the history, you'll, you'll think a country will want to be born. Singapore actually said, please keep us together. Malaysia kicked them out, though they kept the name Malaysia. Malaysia was originally supposed to be Malaya and Singapore. They kept the name, but they kicked out Singapore. And, and this very unpromising beginning, from this, Lee Kuan Yew built it into a, a, you know, a economic superpower, right? That is today. And I read every every speech he ever gave. 
So I, over a one year period, I was only reading Lee Kuan Yew. It was probably in 94 or 95. I'm doing my PhD, but you know, again, this, my, I already con come to the conclusion that the PhD is also was worthless. So I was reading Lee Kuan Yew. And uh, then I hit upon Japan. I realized that this country has a lot to offer us from economic terms, because this country went from absolute poverty to a completely developed nation in about, what, 40, 50 years, post-war. How did that happen? So how did Japan do it? How did Singapore do it? So this, to me, was the beginning of you know, my forming ideas purely from reading. I had never visited Singapore. I had never actually visited Japan. I only visited in 97, first time. But I read so much about it, I kind of felt like I had lived through it, in a way. And so that is, that is how I formed my ideas. So I'd go, I'd read everything I could find about a topic. So I focused on the Honda Motor Company, for example. I probably read three or four books about Honda. Everything I could find about Honda. So then the rural roots of that company and what was the uh, early days like, all of it. So this was giving me a perspective that it's almost like cheating. You live through it, right? So you are visualizing it. You are, you are living through that experience. And so that was the formative. This is about 94, 95, 96. That's when this company, our company got started. But having that experience is vital because that's how I could say that, well, we are going to be at this for 30, 40, 50 years. So I'm not going to make any rushed decisions. I'm not going to do things for this year, this quarter, all of that. Because I had read all this. I had read, my reading informed me. And so that was how that whole my reading habit. And, and the fact that I ignored all my classes in IIT and mostly I got turned off. I mean, I turned on my PhD thesis in about four months of work. I really only put in four months of work. In fact, my advisor asked me in the end, uh, hey, I, I liked your thesis, you are good. I said, I only put in four months. I mean, I cheated. <laughs> because it's mathematical work, that's how it is, right? You suddenly get an inspiration, you do some intense mathematical work, you turn it in, you are done. So that was how it was for me. I barely paid attention the rest of the time. But I was reading like this. Uh, that was vital for our later what would turn out to be in this company. But that... To me, that lesson lived with me. Any topic, now I just go, I start with a Wikipedia article on it, then I go in, the experiences about it. It's, it could be technology, it could be country. For example, now why I formed the kind of political views I formed. I mean, early on I told you I rejected socialism, but I didn't know what I was for. You know, I knew what I was against, but I didn't know what I was for. But then I read about 15 years ago, I started reading about Chinese history. Why would I read Chinese history? I realized this country is repeating what Japan had done. It was repeating in real time. We were seeing it, we were watching it. I could see that China was coming up. Then I wanted to read all about their history. I wanted to understand China. So I probably spent an entire year, two years, immersed in China immersed in China. I was reading everything I could get my hands on. And the great leap forward, where about 30 million people died in famines. This is imposed by Mao's uh, decision to you know, forcibly industrialize. This is what they call the great leap forward. This is between 1958 and 62. They lost about 30 million people in that. Then the Cultural Revolution, uh, 66 to 76 and untold suffering, where all the schools, all the colleges were closed. You will send a, a, you know, a, a doctor to be a, a cleaner in, the, in, a, in a village because to teach them socialist consciousness. As a doctor, you don't have proper consciousness, so you have to be taught all this. The Red Guards will mercilessly torment school teachers. Hundreds of thousands of people committed suicide, school teachers, doctors, all of that. All the colleges are shut down. This was the devastation Cultural Revolution did by 76. And in 76, if somebody would have said, 
by in the next 30 years, China will go on to become one of the leading economies. Nobody would have believed it. Absolutely nobody would have believed it. Right? And yet that's what actually happened. So then I read about Deng. What were the reforms? Like what happened under Deng? What happened in 1978? So I probably know, I think it's safe to say, India, I probably have read the most test of all of that. I've read more about Chinese history of all that than about Indian history in this, simply because I wanted to understand China so much. And so I can see, I could see that it was all from all of that reading, I could see, I could live that experience. What was their experience of this? Which also, in a way, you could interpret events happening with that whole uh, frame of mind from that experience as though we have lived through it. So which is why when you know, people you know, hear some left liberal will say, oh, we live in a dictatorship. They say, have you ever experienced a dictatorship to come and tell us? And this is the same people who imposed emergency on us. And they claim we live in a dictatorship now, <laughs> right? It's the same people. And so it's uh, that, then you know that they have zero historical understanding. They seem to have never read anything at all to be able to say these things, like dictatorship, throw around words like the Hitler, Hitler, <laughs> as though they know. I've read, actually I read an entire history of the Nazis, how they came to power, what happened, all of that. So I spent a uh, year in Princeton on that topic. So like that, this is the, you know, if you have that wealth of reading, reading, understanding, and that experience that comes from it, living through it. That's why I, my reading is always focused on a topic. If I'm if I'm spending uh, three, four months on only one topic, I won't mix it up. I'll be reading only on that. So I'll find three books on it. I'll order all the books I could find on the topic. Pretty much all the top books I would have ordered. And then I'll be reading. Some books I don't finish because I realize that it's already territory I've already gone through. Then I'll skip that. But I'll just get all the books and then I'll go through it. And for three, four months I'll be in it then I'll have a, some understanding of the topic, then I'll move on to the next one. So that's, that's the, the way I've been reading. And this cultural revolution, for example, this event now has informed my own evolving political views because what happened in America in the last 10 years, I could clearly see the red guards, what was happening in American universities. This had already started in, uh, when I was in Princeton. I could see the beginnings of it the absolute intolerance of people in the name of progressive tolerance, all that. Even, I was a student in Princeton, I was not very, I mean, I was not politically interested at all. But still people would be, there would be these things that will, there will be a, a march for this or a march for that. And it wouldn't make sense to me at all. And, uh, but I didn't have a very strong views on that subject. But then I started observing the last 10, 15 years what was happening in the campuses, by the time 2016 rolled along, I could predict Trump could get, will get elected. I could predict this. In fact, in California, we had a betting pool in our office, and 17 of my colleagues bet that Trump would, Hillary will win. I bet that Trump is going to win. You guys are all going to get shocked because you don't understand your own country. And you see what happened. Because I was reading. I was reading all of the material I could get my hands on, I could see how much anger there was in the country about all of the, this. Uh, and, and so the left always overreaches like this. And this happened in America. I saw this happen in America. You know, I was there, witnessed it. In California, it was, I was there during the entire period in California. It's like if you are not, for example, you know, screaming at the top of your lungs in a BLM march. BLM proved to be a complete fraud, by the way. That entire organization is a fraud. Completely corrupt. It's true, by the way, I'm, I'm willing to say it in Twitter. It is, it is true, they have found it. But in a particular moment, if you are in Palo Alto, if you are in Saratoga, if you are not marching on BLM, they'll call you racist. This happened in California, in real time. We lived through this. So all of this was happening, and this was the Red Guards. This was exactly the litmus test the Red Guards would post, put on you. And the same thing, if you don't have the all the the various color flags in your office. In fact, I visited one of our customers in New York City. The entire office was festooned with various pride flags. An entire month, they told me. 
The entire month was only fried flax. This is exactly what the communists were doing in China. Slogans and all over the walls, indoctrination all the time. And yet somehow the, the left wing in America could not see the parallel. That what they were doing was exactly the same thing. It's like if you have every wall in this thing has to have a Modi poster. We know what to call it, right? But we don't do this. But this is what the left will do and then call it democracy, call it freedom. And I could see it. I could see this happening in America. And then I could see the same thing happening in India. In fact, one of the reasons why I decided to become active in this is I could see that some of the, the media here, they simply borrow those ideas. They don't have an original thought in their head. Whatever the New York Times prints, the next week the Hindu will print here. Right? At least be original, guys. Don't copy them. <laughs> right? At least be original. So this was, this is, because I, then I might as well read the New York Times. Why should I read the Hindu? I mean, I already got the same thing there. If I want to form my political views, I already got it there. You know, this is derivative crap here. So you're not even original. So I could see it. And I could see this from my reading. So somewhere from not being, you know, I'm focused on business, I'm focused on technology, I could see this. And from cultural revolution, I could see how intolerance arises. And the real roots of intolerance. And then I could finally connect that intolerance to, it's go back and back and back. It is... There is only one right way. There is only one right idea. Then this notion of anybody who disagrees is committing blasphemy. You could see this, right? That is the idea of blasphemy. This is what the Red Gods imposed. If a Mao uh, picture is slightly torn somewhere, somebody is going to jail for it. This happened in China in the 1960s, late 60s. You'd be in, uh, you know, if somebody looked at funny on a Mao picture, they could go to jail. Somebody will out them. Sometimes their own children would out them. Their children will watch uh, you know, their father or mother looking at the Mao picture funny or laughing at it, and they will out them. All this is documented history in China, by the way. I read like maybe five books on cultural revolution from the perspective of people who are persecuted, from the perspective of people who did the persecution. The Red Gods, some of them have written books now, and you can read them. So, and you could see the same thing happening. So this idea of the one right way. Then I could see that how that comes into even religion, right? This idea of blasphemy. That there is only one right way. Anybody who disagrees has to be punished or sometimes killed, right? And this, is, this, this, this fundamental idea, this existed in a variety of moments. Maoist is one, just only one of them. But it's there now in the woke culture and you have to be cancelled. If you say the wrong thing, you have to be cancelled. Well, they have, you know, since then they have attempted to cancel me about 15 times, and uh, our business keeps growing, so. <laughs> so I, actually, I love the left to cancel us because our business grows, free marketing, so. <laughs> because anyway, the, those, uh, the woke left doesn't have any money to buy anything anyway, so it's, it's good for their business. <laughs> so I don't really care to offend them anyway, no. So that's, that's the reality, right? Only those with the money who buy influence the business. So they can cancel me all they want. And the more they attempt to cancel me, the more our business booms, not only in America, in the Middle East, in Europe, everywhere. <laughs> so it's you know, something magical. I don't know what. The, the more cancellation, the better business. So I decided, okay, the, then the work has actually no clue at all how the world works. So they're, they're, the people they attempt to cancel become only more popular. Uh, it, experimental evidence. I mean, I have myself to offer as experimental evidence in this. So this is the, and I, I could see the, how the intolerance, the roots of it, coming from this one right way, or only right way. This is the only truth. And you can see this everywhere, right? This is not just in the field of political ideology. The, the word religion itself comes from that idea of, I mean, the word religion, that's why I don't like to use it in our, our Hindu context. We have to use something else, dharma or path or something. Because this idea that there's only one right thing, it fundamentally does not suit our culture. We are fundamentally tolerant. We are fundamentally, you know, let's go along to get along people. And this is, you know, we, this is, this, nobody needs any other proof. Just look at, look at our society, how diverse it is. How many different ideas have coexisted, not just recently, for thousands of years. And did Shankara and Ramanuja agree with each other? Did Madhava and uh, Shankara agree with each other? In fact, I have a colleague 
who very actively tries to convert me from Advaita into Dvaita, he tells me, you are a Mayavada. <laughs> He's a very passionate Dvaita. He wants to take me to his guru so that I will follow the one true path, Dvaita. <laughs> Serious, I have a colleague. We have an, often have debates in the office about this. And all of this have coexisted. This is not new, right? Dvaita is not new. This is thousand year old now for us. So this is our history. This is our philosophy. And so this whole idea that there's only one right way, there's only one right path, everything else has to be purged. That is the root of all of this intolerance. And that's what my read of history taught me, cultural revolution to all of the various things. And to preserve this, to preserve this idea of Bharat, this idea of philosophical freedom, it has to be actively fought for. It's not going to just fall into our laps free. It's not free. Freedom is not free. So this idea of intellectual freedom, this idea of free-spirited inquiry, all of this has to be nurtured. It has to be fought for. So that is the ultimately, to me, the connection to business because ultimately a business, you know, from a, if I have to explain it to a literary person, I will say, it gives you a little domain of freedom to be yourself, in a way. Because the customer buys our product, but the customer only has a limited capacity to influence us. They can choose to buy or not to buy. It's binary. But they don't impose their political, religious, any views on us. Same as way, when we buy a product from somebody, we don't go to impose our thoughts on them, our views on them, right? We choose to buy or not buy, that's it. So it gives you a, a and so the idea of free enterprise business is absolutely necessary to preserve freedom. And I can see it. I mean, I'm, I'm only free to speak only because there's a business backing it. And then ultimately. And that is why I think, yeah. So that's to me my, uh, my last parting thought on this. So the, the connection to business to me is, which is why I ultimately realized why I love to be in business, continue to be in business. People ask me, why aren't I in politics? Well, why would I give up my freedom? <laughs> so, but that's, that's where I am today. But the, this idea of reading as experiencing lives, experiencing parallel lives, we probably experienced five parallel lives as Japanese, as a Singaporean, as Chinese, living through the Cultural Revolution, living as a Red Guard, living as a Red Guard's victim, all of that. So that's what has informed my perspectives now. And then living through the whole woke revolution in the US. That I actually lived through. I didn't have to read about it. So that's, that's all there is. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The brilliant work you've been doing. May I ask, what is the experience that you're immersing yourself in so I can catch up? <laughs> so right now I'm actually uh, reading about Japan again. Japan post-bubble and the demographic bust of Japan. So Japan is going first where they simply have stopped having kids. They've simply stopped having kids and every country is following. In fact, we are following it in South India already right now. We are well below replacement and, and the birth rate is dropping and dropping and dropping. The consequences are visible in Japan, they are visible in Korea, all of those countries. So that's what I'm reading about because I'm actually very worried about that. And then the climate change, what is going to happen to our earth with all. So this is where I, yesterday I talked a lot about contentment. That how, if we don't match our prosperity, the getting it, all the getting rich with contentment, we are going to destroy the earth. So that's what I'm reading about now. So thank you. Good evening, sir. My name is Tingu. Uh, you said you have experienced cu few cultures. Yeah. So how has human capital evolved uh, towards the growth of that particular culture? And how do you see Bharat in that particular you know, yeah. race or how are you calling it? We, see, I have experienced now people coming from very humble rural backgrounds producing beautiful, brilliant technology. We actually have visibly seen this. 
people without uh, uh, really uh, fantastic educational background, but yet doing brilliant technology that the world wants. So we have that innate talent in our country. I can, I, I can say this as an experimental evidence with evidence, not just theory. And we have scratched the surface of the potential of our country in terms of the talent pool. There's so much more to do. But I'll also say this, we have to figure out a way of prosperity that is not simply the materialistic Western paradigm right now, because we are going to destroy the earth. I, I will give you this myself as an example. My own energy consumption when I was in America was about 1,000 times the energy consumption of my grandmother in our village in India. 1,000 times, easily. So one million of people like me would consume one billion Indians like her. And so this is, this is not the prosperity we can afford anymore, in our, not in our nation. So we have to figure out our own solutions. And actually, uh, Sri Aurobindo will offer lessons. I've been actually reading some of his works now. And he said, it is difficult, yeah, I agree. But now I know why it's difficult. No, he said, you have to learn some Sanskrit, maybe. But yeah, that definitely we have to figure out new answers. And, and I will also humbly submit that the West does not have the answers. So we should stop listening to Harvard Business School, all that. We should figure out our answers here. So, thank you. Yeah. So one question. Uh, in the last few years, I've met a lot of youngsters who have studied in the US, including my own son, which is probably the reason I met so many kids. And most of them have fallen prey to this woke culture that you describe. How do we get them out of it? Can we send them to you? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I knew the answer to that one, because I don't know, actually. But you, there are ways to, you have to engage them slowly, ask them about this or that. They'll, They'll admit to some of them. Will admit to some occasional doubts. So you have to, you have to, you have to give them doubts. That's all. In other words, this is the see that exactly like any type of this monolithic dictatorship, it will collapse the moment you get one doubt in your mind. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you. I think I exhausted my quota. Thank you.